Hi everyone, Ryan here with Fight Game Analysis, and today we're going to be talking about Floyd Mayweather. Specifically, we're going to be breaking down some film from a few of his past fights and analyzing some of the ways he uses setups on his opponents to land beautiful shots. In my opinion, Floyd is the greatest fighter of his generation, and he should be talked about in the discussion as an all-time great. Now, there's a few people out there who hold a little bit of a different opinion, Floyd being one of them. I can make the, uh, the extraordinary look ordinary. That's what's so great about my career. There's a difference between a great fighter and TBE. And I proved that I'm the best. You know, I would like to say, you know, the best ever. You know, it's not being cocky or arrogant. I think I've, I've earned the right, you know, to call myself TBE. I'm gonna stay at the top, do what I want to, how I want to, and, and continue to control boxing, because when you speak boxing, you're speaking Mayweather. I do what I want to do, when I want to, and how I want to. And for the most part, he did. He was absolutely right. For the latter half of his career, Floyd was unquestionably the A-side of every single fight he went into. The pay-per-view king, the cash cow, the face of the sport. He was the man. Now, I don't think he's the GOAT, but like I said, that's a matter of debate. What isn't debatable is that after beating Oscar De La Hoya, he went into an absolutely different stratosphere. What I do know is that you can't reach the level that Floyd did without being extremely talented. He's got names on his resume like Miguel Cotto, Oscar De La Hoya, Manny Pacquiao, Shane Mosley, Canelo. You don't beat guys like that just because you're fast, you're strong, you're explosive. Athletic gifts will only take you so far. You don't reach the tippy top of the sport just by having fast hands and a good jab. The way that Floyd did, you have to be incredibly smart too. Your ring IQ has to be at the top. And his was. In my opinion, it was at the absolute pinnacle of the sport. And still it was underrated. I don't think he gets quite enough credit for how smart he was in the ring. Those in-ring adjustments particularly, man, those were something else. But I'm so crafty. All I had to do is find one thing. I mean, everything, he just put everything together. Just, I mean, dude, perfect. But Mayweather, you know, besides that, he's, he's one of the smartest fighters I've ever seen fight. So let's jump in, break down some of the film, and take a look at some of the times Floyd was able to use his ring IQ to execute beautiful setups and land shots on his opponents. The first fight that I want to take a look at is against Ricky Hatton. Both men were undefeated at the time and coming off impressive performances, and a lot of people thought that the hitman could pose some real problems for Mayweather. Floyd was known for having incredible boxing skills, but there were still some people out there that thought he was a little bit of a pretty boy. That if you got inside on him, you could rough him up and make him uncomfortable, take him out of his element. And if that was going to be the case, then Hatton was likely the man for the job. He was known for coming in and just being absolutely relentless. He just came forward from the start of the first round and didn't let up. Piled on incredible pressure on his opponents and did great work on the inside. And in the build up to the fight, he knew how big of a test this was. He said, my heart is going to explode before I stop coming forward. And from the opening bell, that is exactly what we saw. Hatton applied pressure nonstop. There were some times when he was effective, but it didn't take long for Floyd to start finding a home for that right hand. Hatton was just too easy to time coming in. He wasn't using a lot of feints. He was moving in straight lines. Floyd was having a field day. But still, it took until the 10th round for Mayweather to find that perfect shot. So this is the start of that ending sequence. They're clinched up. Joe Cortez steps in to break up the action. And that's when it all begins. Floyd's along the ropes, and he starts to slide along him towards the corner, baiting Hatton in. Now, at this point, he already knows what he wants to do. This is all a part of the setup. He's moving just fast enough to stay out of range, but just slow enough to let Hatton come in and close the distance. Once Floyd gets to the corner, you can see he takes this perfect stance. He's heavy on his front foot, and his body's positioned in a way that allows him to easily escape out of the back door once he throws that hook. So at this point, he's just waiting for Hatton to step in and commit. And as soon as he does, as soon as Hatton takes that step forward, dips a little bit to the left, that's it. Floyd's been seeing that move all night long. He immediately 
fires off his own left hook, then leans back and steps out of the way of Hatton's left hand and rolls out of that backside. Just beautiful execution. Now, when you watch that full speed real time, you think, man, that was a great check left hook. Floyd can put it all together. He can make it happen. And that's true. But there's actually so much more to the story. You know, Ricky Hatton had fought a lot of really good fighters up until that point who had landed a lot of really good check left hooks in their life, but they weren't able to do it on him. But Floyd was. And when you think about what goes into being able to land that shot and the story behind it, it's just that much more impressive. I mean, you think about Floyd, been in the sport training forever. He's been practicing that move for 20 years. He's thrown that left hook 50,000 times, you know, against Roger and his father when they're in there working with the mitts. When he's younger, he's in there against taller guys, longer guys, guys with bright hands, heavier guys, and just working on that timing over and over and over again, being able to see, probably getting crushed with right hands while he's just trying to figure it out, messing up the timing. But eventually he was able to get it. And that's why he's great because now he's under the bright lights against the best in the world. And all of that experience, all of that training, he's able to make it look effortless. He knew exactly what Hatton was gonna do before he even did. Bait him, set it up perfect, beautiful execution on that move. Part of what made it so perfect is the fact that he executed it in a way that Hatton thought he had the upper hand. Hatton thought that he was backing Floyd into the corner that he was gonna be able to make his move now. And it was all just setting the trap for Floyd to be able to take off with that left hook. The next fight that I want to take a look at is against Diego Corrales. This one happened a little earlier in Floyd's career, down on 130 pounds, but his skills were already top notch. There was a lot of hype going into this one because of how good both men were. The public really wanted to see how it was going to play out. Corrales was known as a big puncher, but he was long, tall, rangy for the division. But he didn't fight from the outside like a boxer like you'd expect with that range. He was all about getting inside and landing big shots on guys. And at this point in his career, Mayweather was still known for using a lot of movement, very quick, great footwork. So it was poised to be a matchup of contrasting styles. Now, a lot of people thought this was going to be a competitive fight, but from the opening bell, it was just a one-sided affair. Floyd was out there. He was just too much for Corrales. This sequence that we're going to look at is in the seventh round, and it leads to the second of five knockdowns by Floyd. Mayweather had already dominated the fight up until this point, and he actually scored a knockdown earlier in the round. Corrales was already pursuing Mayweather all night, but being down on the scorecard so drastically just made him that much that much more desperate. And one of the punches Floyd was seeing the most success with was the jab to the body. He was stopping Corrales in his tracks a lot when he was trying to walk Floyd down, and was also sapping his energy. But the really beautiful thing that Floyd did with it was that he used it to hide the left hook to the head. At the very beginning of both punches, the split second when Diego's trying to get his read and defend, they both look exactly the same. When your jab to the body and your left hook upstairs both look the same, even for a split second, it makes it really tough to defend. Floyd goes to the body with the jab five times in the minute and a half leading up to this knockdown. All of them getting through clean. Corrales knows he's got to figure out a way to stop that. And then on this one, Floyd stops, sets up exactly like he does when he goes to the body. And as soon as he flinches, you can see Corrales bring his right hand and his elbow in to try to block what he thinks is going to be another jab to the body. Instead, Floyd goes upstairs with a hook and just drops him. Great setup by Mayweather. The beauty in that is just the way he had Corrales completely confused as to what's next. He disguised that left hook to look exactly like the jab to the body. Masterful display of boxing. And the last fight that we're gonna take a look at is against Juan Manuel Marquez. <laughs> now this one was a little tough for me to pick personally. Marquez is one of my all time favorite fighters, man. I really, I really enjoy watching him fight. But the move that Floyd pulled was just too beautiful. So ultimately I couldn't pass up the opportunity to put it in here. Now the move that Floyd goes with here is the pull counter. He made it famous, everybody's seen him do it, but not a lot of people really understand it. The whole purpose of this is to take away your opponent's jab. Anytime you see Floyd pull this out, it's because he doesn't want his guy throwing a jab anymore. Most fighters build their entire game around their jab, so if you can take that away from them, it puts them at a huge disadvantage. Now this one here happens at the beginning of the sixth round. Marquez comes out, and in the first 30 seconds of the round, he tries throwing a few jabs. And that's just enough 
for Floyd to see the opportunity for the setup. So the first thing he does is lean forward over his front foot with his hands down. Now that is something that you would never traditionally be to taught to do. He's inviting Marquez to throw a punch. But you can see he's also got a wide stance, weight over his front foot, back foot up on his toe so they can launch off it. As he feels Marquez is about to throw, he just starts to widen his stance out just a little bit more. And then as soon as Marquez shoots the jab, Floyd slips his head off the center line and coils back a little bit. And that's gonna allow him to spring forward in that right hand and also use that momentum defensively to get underneath that counter shot and out the back door. Look at the way he pulls that off. Floyd pulled that jab out of Marquez. Marquez thought he was going to be able to counter the counter by shooting his own right hand. And Floyd still had an answer for that by getting underneath and outside. Man, that is amazing stuff. But that's why he was able to go in there and dominate for so long. It's great stuff by the champ. So let me know what you guys think. How good were Floyd's setups and how high is his ring IQ? Let me know what you guys think.